Boy, we worry about pets on cold winter nights, but summertime is actually riskier. Oh, dehydration can certainly be a big problem, but skin damage from hot spots and fly strike, big trouble. And then there's those pushed in face breeds with their breathing problems, they've got their own, their own brand of misery. Does anybody know someone who's had a dog with these kinds of problems? Boy, put their name in the comment line. They can tune in now, or they can, uh, this, this will be living on my Facebook page after we're done. And by the way, in case I haven't uh, met anybody here, my name is Dr. Jeff Nickel. I'm a veterinarian, and this is Miss America, the Nickel family border collie. And let me see who's here. Oh, Cindy, thank you so much for coming. I, you know, I hope nobody here has this problem, and maybe this is one of those things where people can pass this on to friends. And I'm going to be very specific about the kinds of dogs who have these types of problems. You know, interestingly, we essentially, I shouldn't say never, but cats with heat stroke and other hot weather problems are seldom a big issue because, well, you can call it good sense if you want to, but they lay low when conditions are maybe a little bit risky. They're much better about seeking out shade and not, you know, wigging out. Um, so, by the way, if everybody can hear me loud and clear, please hit the wow button just so I know that technically we're doing okay. And if this information is helpful or if you feel like passing it on, again, put somebody's name in the... Oh, there's a heart. Thank you. Good. Valuable information. That's all I'm trying to accomplish here. So, I'm going to start with a story. This is one of many cases of heat stroke that I have seen over the years. And in my work as an emergency veterinarian. Alexandra, thank you for coming. I hope, uh, you know, wherever you folks live, I thought I'd do this subject at the early part of the summer because here we are in Albuquerque and uh, it can get mighty hot here. Although, yeah, it's dry heat and that brings up the necessity of water. So here's a story among many of, of, um, of heat stroke problems that I have treated. This was a big German Shepherd, about 90 pounds, and he was a breeding dog. So, of course, he was not neutered. And next door to him, on the other side of the wire fence, was the neighbor who had a female dog who was not spayed. Well, she was just coming into the fertile time in her heat period, and he was just losing his mind. Now, don't forget that fences are not something that our dogs can innately understand. You know, it's just not hardwired into their genetic behavior programming and they well you know we've all seen dogs who fence fight with the dog next door which can be another cause for ramped up body temperatures in the summertime and maybe dogs don't have enough sense in some cases because if they get fired up about some dog next door or in the case of this big german shepherd with this female in heat and all he could do was run up and down that fence losing his mind because well let's see you know nature is what nature is you know, when you think, you don't have to think about it, I can tell you about the research on, on a subject called ethology, which is the causes, both immediate term and long term, of animal behavior, including humans. And we know from ethology that for most any species that you can mention, um, there are two primary objectives. One is survival, and the other is passing on their genetic code, or reproduction. Okay, who else showed up? Let me say hello. Alexandra. Oh, thank you so much for coming. So, you know, the reproduction thing, you could say that this German Shepherd was not intelligent. He was simply following his innate, essential behavioral drives. But of course, somebody put a fence in there and he couldn't deal with it. And he got frantic and running back and forth. It was about 90 degrees out. And uh, they called my office and they said, we think maybe we have a problem. Oh, we don't ask questions get that rascal in ASAP and here's what you do in the immediate, immediately spray that dog down with water. You can immerse him if you want, but you don't take time to fill the bathtub with cold water and get that big dog in there because seconds really count. So spray him with a hose and then grab some rubbing alcohol from the medicine chest and some, you know, gauze pads or, or even a wash, a few washcloths and you put, you soak those washcloths or gauze pads with rubbing alcohol and you put it in the dog's armpits, in the groin, 
And the reason is there's not a lot of hair in those areas, so we can suck a lot of heat out of the body as that alcohol evaporates. But also between the foot pads underneath the paws and spray them with cold water and get them in the car and get to the emergency hospital ASAP. So how did these people know that their dog was having a problem? Well, fortunately, they were paying attention. They noticed that he was out there panting extremely hard and he was starting to run out of steam, although he was continuing to run the fence. And the tongue had developed a purple cast because, and you've probably seen this sometimes with dogs who pant normally. Here's Miss America, she's panting. But you notice that her gums, I don't know if you can see that, are a healthy pink. I mean, she's not like overdoing it. Dogs have to pant when they get a little warm. Unlike us, we of course evaporate moisture off our skin surface and that evaporation cools us are sweating. Dogs, of course, don't have sweat glands, and so they evaporate moisture by moving air back and forth, back and forth through their mouth and their throat, and they evaporate moisture from those tissues, and they cool themselves. But this German Shepherd, he couldn't, he'd, he'd gotten behind, and his body temperature was spiking. When he arrived, he was at 106, and much more than that, we start getting the risk of permanent brain damage, liver damage, and a real nasty clotting problem in the blood, abbreviated DIC. It's called disseminated intravascular coagulation. And that is a huge problem, very hard to turn it around. So again, time matters. And these folks had noticed that their dog's tongue had gotten purple and was staying that way, as he could not catch up and actually take in a lungful of air to oxygenate his blood because the overwhelming priority was trying to survive. Um, a lot of thick uh, drool, saliva hanging off his mouth. And, uh, and you can tell, not necessarily when you touch a dog like that's coat, but you reach under their armpits and they're hot or inside of their ear flap or their gums. You don't need to take time for a thermometer, but just touch their gums. And if you've ever touched your dog's gums, you get a sense of what normal about 101 is. And if they're up four degrees, you know it. So don't waste time. Spray with water, alcohol on washcloths or, or little gauze pads be under the foot pads, between foot pads on the underside of their paws, armpits and groin, and get in the car and get moving. When we saw this guy, it was touch and go. I was not at all sure we were going to turn this around, but we got him in the bathtub and we started intravenous fluids, cool fluids, to get the hydration going. And of course, we put an oxygen mask on him right away. And as soon as he started to calm down a little bit, we were able to give him a little bit of sedation and put a tube down into the windpipe and give him straight oxygen. Um, it was very difficult to turn this guy around and very gradually he did make it. Um, these are, gosh, and I've had cases that didn't. So you can prevent heat stroke. And of course, we all know the importance of fresh water. We know that you know, if you chain or tie a dog outside um, and you think, well, he's got shade, and here's his water, shouldn't be a problem. But you know Murphy's Law. And they start you know, moving and jumping around and they pull, knock over the water and then they wrap the chain or the rope around the tree and now they're in the hot baking sun. So honestly, I always urge people never to tie a dog up. So many things can go wrong. Um, so I've got another, do I have a question here? Let me see. Oh, hey, Trila, thank you for coming. And Elizabeth. Boy, I'm so happy that I've got some of these great people who've been here before. Don't you agree, Miss America? So heat stroke prevention, right? If your dog is inside in an air-conditioned house, then that's pretty good. And here in the dry southwest, um, where, you know, evaporative cooling, we have something called swamp coolers. It's the, uh, the poor man's uh, refrigerated air conditioner. They actually work pretty well almost all the time. And they have these things that you can run along your porch and they, and they squirt a misted water that evaporates and that can be pretty good too. But confining a dog so that there isn't a place for him or her to get away from where they are and find a cool place, boy, you just don't want to take that gamble. So heat stroke, let's, let's avoid that. But if you are suspicious, run that dog into the veterinarian. I would rather see 99 dogs out of 100 when people come racing through the door and go, you know what, we're okay, it's a different problem, than this one, and they die. Uh, just completely unnecessary. So 
you know, what about some of this other stuff? Well, I'll tell you, especially with big black dogs or big dark colored dogs, and Miss America here is what we call a medium sized dog at about 38 pounds. But bigger dogs have a different ratio of the amount of surface area on their body and the volume of their body, which of course is what generates heat. And so they're more prone to heat stroke. But the other problem with these big dogs is especially as they get older, they just aren't as active anymore because you know their joints get a little uncomfortable. So here they are in the summertime, and if it's an older female dog in particular that might be dribbling just a tiny bit of urine, or maybe have a little bit of moist stool around the rear end, and you have big thick fur back here, doesn't even have to be matted, although that makes it worse, um, then the body really can't well, it doesn't evaporate moisture, but it can't dissipate heat from the skin, which it does. And so you've got that moisture back there, and the, no, the normal populations of bacteria, and there's small amounts of them that belong on the skin that are part of skin health. But when it gets real warm and then moist, and then it's trapped and dark beneath thick fur, well, bacteria can just run rampant in the hot weather. And so we see those problems, and we get these rapidly advancing skin infections on the surface of the skin. And then if they get a little further advanced, and then we have um, kind of a discharge, a serous discharge from the skin, the flies find that irresistible, and especially, again, if there's a little bit of stool back there. And they come in, and you think, oh, that's disgusting. Oh, it gets much worse because they lay eggs, and those eggs pupate into a larval form and those maggots will start eating into the skin. I know this is disgusting. I'll tell you what, if you've ever seen this, you don't know what gross is. And not only does it smell horrible and is horribly uncomfortable for the dog, but the infection and overwhelming inflammation actually can be fatal. And these things can advance in the space of several hours. So if you have, any dog goes outside a lot of the time, but especially a big dark colored older dog, you need to roll that dog over on her or his side and raise one back leg and then with a good light or a flashlight, take a careful look around your dog's anus and genitals in the groin area. Um, and you think, how often do people do that? Well, the problem is they don't. And they don't find out that their dog has serious hot spots or maggots in that area until the pet is feeling horrible. So you know, like everything else, if you can recognize it early, for goodness sake, you know, if you're concerned, Bring the pet in. But this is not something you say, well, gee, I don't have time today. I'll bring them in tomorrow. Don't do that. Um, your time matters on those as well. These are medical emergencies, and we do not play games with this stuff. What we need to do with these, these hot spots, which, by the way, aren't just in the rear end department. They can occur on a pet's side. Sometimes we see them on the sides of their heads, often under the armpits, because, you know, again, there's not a lot of ventilation when the pet's lying down a lot sometimes in the groin, uh, but they can be on an exposed area of the skin too. And what we have to do is get all that discharge off the surface of the skin so that we can clean it and not trap bacteria on the skin surface. So we, we clip the matted hair from it that's usually glued down with this discharge. And then we scrub it with a particular type of disinfectant scrub. And very often these pets need antibiotics. They sometimes need um, anti-inflammatory medications. Um, we, uh, boy, we don't play games with those. You do not take a conservative approach with these. And you want these pets to feel better as fast as they can. So, you know, some of these other summertime things, you know, the most, w one of the most common things change a little bit, but right now, one of the most common problems seen in a general veterinary practice is ear infections. And people say, well, my dog's had a few of those. Very often, it's not a few different ear infections. It's very often one ear infection that we got pretty good control over, reduced the inflammation, the pet felt better, stopped scratching its ears, the person didn't notice the bad odor anymore or the discharge and said, great, we've got that one solved, and darn it, here it comes again. Well, that does happen, but very often instead what happens is that we never really got rid of the darn thing and it came back. So why do we see so many ear infections? Well, number one, they're more common in the summer, and during the warm months is when we're more prone to see problems with allergies. You know, airborne stuff like pollens, house dust, and molds, and the same kinds of things that people can be allergic to. Well, 
Those things are more prone to occur in the summer, but the damage the dog does is also more prone to be worse in the summer because they scratch, scratch, scratch at their ears um, very commonly when they're by themselves because they're not don't have their person there to pay attention to. And they damage the, the inside of the ear canal just by scratching and beating the heck out of the outside of their ear. And so you get overgrowth of the normal organisms that belong in there in low numbers. A few bacteria, a few yeast have all the business in the world there because they help with the normal balance of uh, local host defense in there. Well, they get out of control and you get these nasty infections. So dogs who scratch, you know, they need to see their doctor. And dogs, you know, I, I like to check my dog's ears. I get my nose right in there and take a little sniff. And you think, well, that's a little gross. <laughs> it really shouldn't be. It should smell just fine. And if it is gross, there's a problem. See, the real difference is that our ear canals go in horizontally from our ears. And they're only going about half an inch or so. But dogs are different. They've got an opening here. You're not going to sit up so people can see anyway, so I won't even try. But there's an opening here. And it comes down, and a medium-sized dog like Miss America comes down the side of their head just about vertically, about an inch and a half, bigger dogs, much longer. And then it makes an almost 90-degree bend to go in horizontally. Well, there's a lot of real estate in there. There's a whole lot of surface area, and especially with floppier dogs, and Miss American is your stick up, that's right. Um, but you know, heavy ear dogs like, like Hocker Spaniels is a good example. And um, boy, they can get just a jungle in there. And in some cases, especially poodles, miniature poodles, normally have a jungle of hair growing down in their ear canals. And so these dogs are more prone to ear infections. And so, yeah, at least once a week, you ought to just get in there and rub right below the dog's the opening to her ear canal. And if she's uncomfortable with that, that's a problem. And if there's an odor, that's a problem. And you know, if you notice discharge, any nasty stuff or redness, that's, that's a red flag. So don't just, oh, give it time. Maybe it'll get well on its own. They do not, they only get worse. And you know, the well-being of the dog really suffers. And, and in terms of the practicality of the expense involved in, in medical bills for pets, boy, you know, we do a lot more work and we've got to do a lot more frequent rechecks and microscopic evaluations and medications. It's a lot cheaper to treat this stuff earlier. So I wouldn't uh, play games with that. The last thing I want to talk about, and by the way, has anybody had any problems like this? If you have any questions, um, if there's any, um, I'm always checking for questions on the, uh, on the smartphone here. Um, if anybody uh, has these problems, wants to just throw a comment out there, or any questions related to this stuff, by all means, interrupt me. The last thing I want to talk about is what we call brachycephalic breeds. These are breeds like Bulldogs and Pugs and Pekingese and Boston Terriers, you know, pushed in face. Brachycephalic is what the skull conformation is called. Um, and you know, let's face it, the evolution of our dogs, you know, in, in the wild, we, where you look at feral dogs, uh, coyotes, wolves, um, you know, dingoes. They're not dogs, but they are related, and they have developed, much like dogs in the wild, um, to survive. And if they've got some bizarre body conformation that does not promote uh, health and vitality and ability to move quickly and to eat prey and to survive another year, well, those, those traits die out. So, you know, these pushed-in-face breeds they were developed by humans, and it doesn't go well, especially in the hot weather. It's like the maker took the pet's face and just before they were born, pushed their nose back because all that normal tissue that belongs in the throat and the pharynx and the soft palate, it's all pushed in a backward direction. It's all still there. It's all just jammed up almost like an accordion in there. Well, you got all that tissue jammed up into a shorter distance and you end up with difficulty for many of these dogs in moving air. Looks like I have a question here. And this is from Elizabeth. Is there a treatment that I can cure the ear problem for good? I was told it's a recurrent problem. Well, uh, it's recurrent because there's an underlying cause that hasn't been managed. And you know, we all love cures. Um, we don't get them with skin problems like you know, the ear canals are an extension of the skin, 
And they, um, uh, you know, if, it's, if the underlying reason for it is um, allergies and the dog's scratching and damaging its ears, uh, we typically don't cure those, honestly. We generally uh, use medications to reduce the itch. Fish oil can be helpful. Antihistamines can make a big difference. Uh, Claritin is particularly good along with antihistamines. It's, uh, the, the combination matters. But nowadays we have some much better medications that your veterinarian can prescribe. Um, one is called cyclosporin and another is, a, um, is an injectable called Cytopoint. And these are very safe and very effective. Now, there's, if there's bacterial infection on the skin surface, if there's smoldering ear infections, it does keep recurring. But if we can stay ahead of the itching, then we've got a shot at that. Um, boy, I wish there was a good simple answer and a cure. Usually it is a matter of staying ahead of those things. So, back to these brachycephalic dogs. Thank you for that question. We've got so much tissue in their throats, they have trouble moving air when they have to pant, 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 pant. So dogs like that are prone to respiratory failure. Oh boy, we gotta be extremely careful. If we say keep a dog in a cool house out of the direct sun in the summertime, it's doubly important for these pushed in face breeds. Um, and on top of that, some of them with their pushed in face, not only have all this extra tissue in their throats, but the trachea, the windpipe, has got a no smaller than normal diameter, making it much harder. And in fact, some of these smaller dogs, the windpipe can flatten and collapse. So there are some of these dogs that are, frankly, a respiratory disaster waiting to happen. And then you add hot weather. So if you are a, just a lover of those little dogs, and I get it if you are, because they are very cute, and also, almost all of them are very sweet, including the great big bulldogs and the little tiny Pekingese and Bostons, um, they're wonderful dogs, and I understand why people love them, but you've got to take special precautions and keep them indoors, in the shade, cool weather, and obviously plenty of, of fresh water. So, I hope there's some good lessons for people here. And Miss America, don't be taken off just because some neighborhood dog barked. Um, I want you to be here because you're better looking. Um, and that's why she's called Miss America, of course. So, for our cat people, um, I'm providing a virtual behavior conference next Wednesday, which is going to be May 27th. And it's only limited to four uh, cat parents or cat parent families. And I will be able to give individual help to people with cats with any cat behavior issue. And so if you'd like to um, participate in that, we'll ask you to register in advance. We're going to do it by Zoom. I do these from time to time. And um, an easy way of getting a hold of me is to just post it on my Facebook page. Just put it as a comment below this Facebook Live, which I'll get posted a little bit later this evening, and it'll be there. And you can say, I'd like to come. I have a cat behavior problem, and I would like to be part of the virtual behavior conference. And uh, we'll get with you and get you registered. Cost is $60 per family, but with only four participants, four attendees, I'll have time to talk about these problems and give people some advice. Um, it's sometimes a, a good way to manage these things without the expense of a two-hour individual consultation. Hi, I'm sorry? Hi, oh, Sid's here. Thank you for coming. I'm just so delighted when I have people I've, I've come to know a little bit from these Facebook Live events. And as always, if people have questions down the road, you're always welcome to post them on my Facebook page. Um, I sometimes use them in my weekly question answer column in, in the Albuquerque Journal. And speaking of which, if you would like to get my Facebook Lives or you know anybody who could benefit and would enjoy these but just can't seem to tune into a Facebook Live while it's live, they can subscribe to my website, which is drjeffnickel.com, D-R-Jeff-N-I-C-H-O-L.com. And at the bottom of the homepage, you can subscribe. And all you have to do is put your email address. Well, here's what you get when you subscribe. Of course, it's no charge. And I'll immediately send you my pet first aid and CPR guide for at-home use. And this is more emergency stuff, and it includes heat stroke, by the way. And, you know, it's worth printing and sticking it on the fridge because sometimes you need that information and you don't want to be, you know, hunting around trying to find it. But the other, uh, the other value is that when you subscribe every Tuesday morning in your email box, you will get the week before's um, Facebook Live 
and you'll get my question answer column from the Albuquerque Journal and you might find information in there that applies to your pets. I try to split my column between cats and dogs and split it evenly between behavior issues and physical challenges of other kinds. Um, and boy, there's a lot of questions out there. And Well, I'm, I'm here to try to make a difference and improve pets' lives and, and the people who love them. So, so thank you again for tuning in, everybody. I'm delighted that we're doing fine, and I hope everybody's doing okay with staying at home and being careful as we open up our our economies and um, keep six feet away and wear a mask. So thank you again for coming and, and have a great evening and, a, and an excellent weekend. And I'll see you next week on Thursday.